Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we have Bob Carlson on the show. Bob, welcome. Good to be here, Mike. All right. This one's going to be a little bit different. Bob, as you're well aware, most of these podcasts are me sitting down with a founder. We talk about their company, and then we talk a little bit about competition. That's, that's why I was wondering why I was here. But Yeah, that, that's not what we're doing with you. So I had an idea to talk with you about angel investing, right? So a number of our listeners who are in the community who listen to this podcast are thinking about starting a company. Maybe they have started a SaaS company. Obviously, that's who at Startup Competitors, that's who we serve. And you are probably the person I'm closest with who is like an actual angel investor. You've been active in it for years and I can embarrass you with your background and like Gravity Venture Days and stuff like that. And and you've been active in the Indianapolis community for a while now. And I know that whenever I find somebody who is looking to get started on the path of fundraising, you're one of the people that I often lean on to to have an initial conversation with them to talk, to help them set expectations, like what's this process going to look like? What should they prepare? Stuff like that. I know you'll you're often really good about giving them feedback, mostly positive. You're like a pretty positive, uplifting guy, which is pretty rare in the angel community. Like you, you like to build people up. So I wanted to talk to you about that process. To whatever extent you're comfortable doing that, you're allowed to change the names to protect the guilty, whatever <laughs> you need to do. Uh, but that that's kind of what I was hoping to explore with you. That sounds great. All right, dude, you're awesome for doing this. I, I appreciate <laughs> it. All right. So why don't we start with, in your mind, pick a recent founder that you sat down with, um, maybe you've had a couple of conversations with them. So, so get one in your head. And then why don't you walk through what that, what your process as a, as an individual investor, both somebody who's trying to like learn about the company, understand the market that they're in, uh, maybe do some early evaluation of the deal. Think of people you can introduce them to, like walk through that process from like when they reach out to you or you get introduced to them. Like what are those first couple of conversations look like? Sure. And and what are you like in the back of your head? Like, what are you looking to get out of those conversations? How are like, what are you thinking of? Great. Uh, and I'd say before I take you through at least how my mind works uh, through those interactions, I, I want to emphasize that I would use the word as it relates to me personally of an angel investor in a I'm very small potatoes, bottom of the food chain. Uh, you know, there are many, many very successful people in town, much higher net worth than me, uh, who do angel investing on a very, you know, responsible, respectable uh, scale. And I do it in very small pieces, bite-sized chunks. I'd probably put a uh, irresponsibly uh, disproportionate amount of my net worth into doing it just because it is fun for me. Uh, And I've had some uh, great training scenarios with Gravity Ventures, uh, who are the high alpha, a couple of high alpha partners. And uh, so being able to kind of see that process and participate in that uh, was very helpful. In addition to just uh, having some other, uh, in some cases, uh, venture capitalists who uh, had invested in companies I worked for and did investing on the side, tell me how they did things. But myself personally, I'm, I'm a guy who writes either small checks or, or no checks at all, but I really do enjoy the interactions as many people do. Uh, and it's always been a uh, kind of a little bit of a hobby of mine because I just do have interest in those uh, entrepreneurs. I think primarily because I don't consider myself an entrepreneur. I'm, I've really never been the person with the business idea or started the business. I've gotten there usually uh, six months to a year, often after uh, the business has been hatched, the idea has started. Uh, people have built some technology, may or may not have some clients, uh, you know, so try to help uh, scale the business, grow the business, secure the first clients or the next set of clients. So uh, I think that's one of the things that's exciting for me is to, to meet the people with the idea. So what I look for to, to answer your question more directly. Well, wait, now, yeah. I, now I have to present the counter. I have to rebut everything you just said. Because <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right, right? There are obviously more active angel investors in the community, much higher net worth. Like there's no question about that. But the, the one thing I would share for somebody who's listening, because I can imagine this pot, this episode getting shared with somebody who's thinking about doing angel investing and has never done it before, or maybe somebody who's only done one or two investments. And they're like, yeah, I might as well be in Vegas. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, okay. like, I made a bet okay. like, cause my nephew came to me and said he was launching sure. a startup, but like, I don't know if I did the right thing, but it was kind of fun. Like I might want to do it again. You know, there's a couple of tidbits I would share. One is through developer town. You know, we've seen hundreds of companies come through there, hundreds of cap tables, 
many, many, many founders that we've seen at Developer Town. They have half of their angel investors are first time investors. Half the people on their cap table are, are people who great make, point. This is maybe great point. their first or second investment. I don't think I'm giving away any secret sauce, but in conversations with Ben at Vision Tech, uh, he has shared some similar things. And like most angel investors, even in the in the Vision Tech network, are only making one or two investments a year through through Vision Tech. Now they have a lot of them, so they can write a lot of checks. Sure, but, but your average angel investor, I think, is not is is active as you know the people who do this for a living, right? Like so, think High Alpha or G Beta, sure, or who are, sure, you know, whoever. Sure. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's a it's a super fascinating discussion to have because I, I do think there are a lot of people who are like, okay, maybe I've dipped a toe in that water and I'm mm-hmm. thinking about doing mm-hmm. it. What does that look like? And then on the other side of that, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to talk to somebody who may be a qualified investor, but you don't even know what that conversation should look like, sure. I mean, how will we give them a template that makes yeah. them feel a little more comfortable? Nope, okay, I sorry. Nope. I apologize. Nope, I'll, that's I'll helpful. That's I'll helpful. Uh, so, uh, and I think a great point to, uh, to make. So, yeah. So for me, uh, what I've usually seen in almost every discussion when somebody introduces uh, somebody who's you know looking for investment or business advice who has started a company, you know, usually in you know within some number of months uh, prior to me meeting them, is you know you always you usually see a passion for the business, you know, and so if that's not there, you know, it, it's very short discussion. And every once in a while, you will meet somebody uh, who found themselves with what they think is an opportunity, but you can tell that they're maybe their full heart is not in it. They're going to just give it a couple more months. And if it doesn't turn into something, uh, you know, they're going to go back to finding a day job, you know, working for a larger company. And so when you see those, I think that's a pretty big red flag early on, because we all know it's, it's a much harder path to go down in general for anyone, even if you have passion. So when that's not there, I think that's it. Most of the people I see do have that passion. You know, they've been working for some amount of time, uh, making no money at all. Uh, the amount of hours they put in are very significant. Uh, and whether it's a technology company, and I've been able to do a little uh, investing in kind of the hospitality business and uh, in, in the real estate business uh, on a very small scale and commercial real estate. In those cases, it's something that what I have found is, you know, they just need to have a very solid path to revenue. And, you know, where in, in you know, kind of the maturing of uh, models and investment, you know, everybody's looking for a million in ARR if you're a SaaS company, you know, on your path to that, you know, do you have some milestones in the business? So revenue milestones, and how are you going to get those first clients? How does that model look uh, after you get a few? Is it going to prove out a model or is that just to pay some bills and to you know be able to uh, provide some air for the company? Or do you see a path to where you can uh, kind of do that based on their past experience or something else they see in the market? Uh, or is this really the first time somebody's tried to sell this uh, solve this problem in this way with that kind of revenue model. So, so that's the path. The other piece I look for then is other key milestones. So if they thought through uh, not just raising money, uh, not just customer acquisition, not just a release of a product or a product roadmap, those are all key things. So you want to know if they've thought through each of those because those are kind of the fundamentals, but then other milestones uh, in the business. Sometimes it is, are they working out of their house and they have four kids and they have not thought about, you know, uh, co-working or some other kind of location to be more productive uh, and that's on their mind. That's easily solved. But then there are examples of other things that can be can be harder to solve. Are you pursuing a market that, you know, I was just with a startup and uh, has a very interesting application uh, in the healthcare space. And, you know, they know that HIPAA and data security is important, but that's not something they have any knowledge or expertise on. And uh, I had a big concern that they're not, it's going to take money, expertise, skill, time. uh, And that alone would be a a hurdle for someone who had not been down that path. So they're either going to need to, in my opinion, partner with somebody, uh, you know, get another co-founder or uh, have an investor who has an interest in the business or is willing to advise them for free on how to solve those problems, uh, not just technically, but legally and process wise uh, as they get their first clients. Uh, The first couple of clients where they were piloting, this was being used internally within the organization. So it really wasn't an issue. So those would be some examples of the types of things you look for. In no particular order, and I truly mean that, I just jotted out a quick list while you were talking. Can can we maybe 
go through a couple of scenarios and I'm just interested in your, your gut reactions to what are some of the questions you would ask in these scenarios? Yeah. So I would say I break it down in those first three or four categories. So I, I usually kind of coming from a sales and marketing side, they ask about revenue first. And to me, it's a pipeline, you know, which is. Uh, All right. Well, let, well yeah. let, let's start there. So if I come to you and I'm, yeah. I'm raising money for a product mm-hmm. where let's say I don't have revenue yet, or maybe the, I, I have some beta customers, mm-hmm. but nobody's written me a check mm-hmm. yet. What do you? What are some of the questions you ask, or what are some of the things going through your head at that point? Yeah, I would like them to describe some of those customer or prospects that they're talking to, right? So, what's if it's a customer? What's the status of that, right? Is this somebody who is, you know, kind of giving them a handshake and said, "When you bring this out, I'd like to test it," or is this somebody where you are actually put the software in their organization? It's being used, you know, in some way, right? Uh, maybe on an internal little trial basis, or maybe with some extra users if it's that kind of a thing. So trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, what's the, the, the structure of that relationship and not that money has to be tied to it initially, but, you know, you need to see a path to that. So is this, if it's a beta customer, have they agreed to paying you something for this software at some point? And if they have, at least then a hand, even on a handshake or some uh, contract, you know, have you and them agreed to what success looks like? Uh, you know, and I've, I've uh, unfortunately seen situations and many people I'm sure listening have where, you know, somebody's had their product in some initial clients for seven, eight, nine months, and they keep asking for revisions of software. They may be paying a very little amount of money or no money at all. And they're really, it's very hard to manage those expectations once that's, that's begun. And it's almost like a little internal free R and D project for, uh, for that organization. So, uh, so those are the kind of things that, you know, not that you can't arrest some of those processes, but those are the kind of things that uh, I, I kind of look at. If it's somebody who just has some prospective clients and doesn't have their first paying client, um, just to kind of see how they view the sales process, you know, from they've obviously have people they've talked to, they've had some interactions. And so I just ask very simple questions about, you know, how many times have they talked to this prospect? You know, what was the reactions? Do they have a clear next step? Uh, is the prospect agreed to the next step? You know, in some cases, uh, you know, people have uh, a proposal or pricing structure those kind of things. You know, usually it's not very matured, but, you know, seeing some of those assets doesn't hurt to kind of see, you know, kind of the professionalism they're using in those initial interactions, just from a standpoint uh, to see what the reaction of the prospect is to those. And you're, which is completely anecdotal and there's totally a self-selection criterion here. So ignore all the biases for a second, but in your experience, when you're sitting down with most founders who are out seeking maybe an initial round of funding, how many of them have like a well thought out sales marketing strategy versus maybe they just got product or they're they're on the path getting product soon and they're just thinking about some of this stuff for the first time? Like what's your experience for like when they sit down with you, you're like blown away like, oh, yeah, like you like that. That's a great strategy. That's that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm I'm totally excited to fund that versus like, OK, there so maybe. I can see the market, I can see the product, but we got to work on the go-to-market strategy. Yeah, I would say, uh, being an old guy, that if, if, you know, I like your term, go-to-market strategy. So if, if you think of go-to-market as all most of the pieces, whether it's segmenting the market, identifying the, the fit of the product, the pricing, the sales process, some of the key marketing, the, you know, as you look at those things, that's kind of how I think of a go-to-market strategy. And that, you know, can be a pretty big, intimidating set of things to do. So I try not to put, although my brain thinks that way, I try not to put that burden on, on the entrepreneurs. What I've found is they've usually optimized a couple pieces of, a, of a, the road to the sale, right? So they have 10, 12, 15 prospects, but they haven't been able to close them or just have a pilot or two. Or they have two or three really solid customers that have contracted with them and they have nobody early on in their pipeline. So often that's because you don't have a lot of resources. Right. I think often also it's just the bias of a founder or two or that initial team. So mm-hmm. it's trying to strike that balance and seeing if, is it because of lack of resources that they aren't doing those other key pieces of a sales process? Or is it a a big blind spot so that that company won't be able to get past it without adding to the team or investing in some way? 
how would you assess if it was a blind spot or not? Uh, I question them about, so if they were somebody who has three or four solid clients and not much of a pipeline, I would ask them, you know, tell me about those clients and why did you have personal relationships with them? And did you get lucky or no? Were these people you never knew before and you really did close them? Well, then why are we having a problem on the front end? Why did you get four and not have any in the pipeline? Well, they fell out because we were so focused on these because the product wasn't, didn't really work for these uh, customers or they four of 20 that they signed, but the others churned. So those are the kind of things that will help me kind of figure out where they might have a, a have a bigger problem. So in that case, if these are the four that are left, they might have a situation where they just cannot figure out customer success. So that's bringing me past even the sales process, right? And it's, you know, everybody has blind spots, you know, me included, you know, I probably have as many or more than anybody does. So uh, it's something that um, it's just are they willing or can oh, they afford to I, get over them? I was, for those listening who can't see us, they didn't see my giant smile on my face yeah. while you were saying that because I'm pretty positive verbatim you asked me all those questions on Tenor Tracker yeah. <laughs> back in the day originally yeah. when we had like two clients and paying clients and you're like, did you have personal relationships with those clients? Did you like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like verbatim you went down yeah. that list of questions. Fantastic. That's maybe not a lot of revenue. Let's back up a step before that. What's the conversation look like with somebody if they're pre-product? Maybe they've started product development, but they don't have a thing yet that is saleable. What are, what are you looking for there? Yeah, their their knowledge of the market, I think, is very important. Then. You know, their knowledge of, you know, can do they have relationships with people that they can efficiently engage with to help partner with them, you know, I use that term loosely, to help them build out that product and who are willing to, if not, actually test the product, review the product, see demonstrations, see mock-ups, you know, wireframes and those kind of things and give them that feedback. Uh, because that's a process that a, a founder who has very strong opinions and isn't willing to kind of take that market feedback, you know, sometimes does get it right. And they themselves can just build a great product. Uh, but when you're able to uh, officially engage the market, either uh, A, have those relationships because you also, you know, kind of know the market. I think that that is a key thing to look for. Uh, and if they feel they can do that, uh, that's also a key set of milestones, right? So great. You know, how many of them know that you're doing this, you know, and starting this business? How long would it take you to get a meeting with them to review this product? You know, how well do you know that? Them and how long have you known them? And, you know, are they in, on board with you? And in some cases, it breaks down there. In some cases, it looks really interesting, right? Because these are key people in that industry uh, that this person has known for a long time. And those people have said, hey, you know, when they mentioned it to him six months ago at an industry conference, call me when, you know, that to me looks like you have some proprietary relationships that can be a great leverage point as you're, you're bringing a new product to a certain market. If the founder who's talking to you isn't full time on the business yet. Let's say she's working, she's still working full time in her normal gig and she's doing this all on nights and weekends and has a outsourced development team that's like, you know, pulling the product together while she's making enough money to be able to pay their bills and stuff like that. That is a scenario we've had a handful of times in the developer town portfolio. How is that a big deal for you? What do you try to pick at there to try to get a commitment? And, you know, it like, can you just go back to your Deloitte consulting job? And if this doesn't work out, and so maybe I don't want to be the person who invests in you, right? right? Like, right. talk, can you talk a little bit about that? And what goes through your head? Yeah. So for me, personally, it's not a big deal. Because, you know, I'm, I'm more patient, and I will kind of because it's fun for me, I will kind of continue to facilitate that relationship to see how it evolves. And, you know, I have no problem giving, I, I call free advice. But I think in many of the cases in town with angels who make bigger investments and, you know, are, are kind of bigger players in this space, you know, they, they're just, they get to see a lot. And, you know, you, you need to be able to get them convinced very quickly. You know, in, in a meeting or two, they just don't have the time. Uh, they get to see a lot of different things. So I think in those cases, it's it's more important to be at a certain stage. And, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, they are looking for somebody who, if they haven't left their job, uh, is willing to, in the near term, you know, if they're going to write a check, uh, do that. And I think in a lot of cases, and, and they, they should be able to expect that. 
And uh, I think it's important. And in a lot of cases, it's, and who's going to come with you, right? Are you going to grab some coworkers? Do you know some other people in the industry? You know, tell me about the rest of the team because uh, it's going to be about, you know, because they're going to be able to put money into the business uh, that accelerates it faster than I would uh, unless they're coming along with me, you know, or I'm coming along with them. Uh, so I think in, in those cases it is. So I'm willing to kind of, and there are others like me, right? So I think also uh, if somebody who's a higher net worth individual has a personal interest in the business or a relationship, maybe it's somebody who would worked for them in the past. I think in those cases, there's more latitude and more patience. Uh, but I think in the in general, you should go into it thinking, you know, if it's somebody who can write a, you know, a check of, you know, high five figures, six figures themselves that you need to be ready to leave your job uh, if you have not already. Immediately, Jason, to that, you actually said something in there that triggered this. The who do you have that might come with you if the person is working a full time job in a health in healthcare and they're launching a healthcare SaaS product mm-hmm. ever any red flags on like who really owns that IP and if they spin out I mean, if they built the product while they're working for that company, there's potential claims that could be made. What's in the non-compete? Like, how do you navigate that kind of stuff? Yeah, so it's funny. So uh, two different companies that I know, in one company, that was something that the uh, employer, you know, and them talked about uh, proactively and, you know, kind of worked through. Uh, and, you know, I actually signed some agreements related to, you know, this is our thing. Meanwhile, also saying they're not going to, you know, use company facilities and, and all those other things. Uh, in, a, in another case is we talked about that specific issue and it was healthcare again. They, it was so different from what they do. And it was something they only did on nights and weekends that it, it didn't seem like anything that really mattered at all. The risk profile was very low. Let me say it that way. So, but I think that's something you need to be aware of if it has anything to do with your, your day job per se, that, you know, your, your employer who's, you know, paying you, you you've got to, you know, kind of take that into consideration and see in relative terms. I know in some larger corporations, they're, you know, they're asking you to disclose anything you're involved in outside, uh, whether it's boards, investors, things like that. And in those cases, I think there's very good reason for it. But, you know, I, I think that's a case by case basis. Outsource development, any strong opinions there if they come to you and say, I have a CTO who's my brother-in-law who's doing this work for me versus I've hired a firm that's doing this work for me? Any strong opinions one way or the other? Yeah. So I've seen it work and fail, I think, in almost all in almost all types of scenarios. I personally feel having some structure. You know, obviously the, the high alpha model, what you guys do at Developer Town, where uh, there's not just, you know, if it's an application that delivers, you know, what I would call somewhat complex functionality, there's data integrations, uh, you're building APIs. Uh, the user experience is important. You know, if you've got an industrial strength kind of application and it's B2B and those kind of things, I think uh, working with an organization who has the structure around development processes and some, if not in-house, you know, multiple relationships around design, development, because, you know, it's never as simple as, you know, uh, picking one development tool. Usually it's, you know, as you get into integrations and other systems and things like that. And, uh, you know, some of those other capabilities come into play. So, uh, but there's also, you know, I think of kind of the Shopify model of e-commerce, right? There are definitely, depending on what you're doing, certain toolkits out there that can be utilized very easily that do provide you know, a robust capability potentially for someone. And you don't need to, you, you can do it a little less I'll say in-house, you know, in your attic, in your garage, uh, per se, if it's more off-the-shelf capabilities and you're bringing some other unique differentiation to that business. I'm jumping around, so you just got to hang with me. No, that's going to be hard for you. IP, how much weight or thought or caring do you give to defensible IP versus just, you know, maybe there's nothing defensible here. It's all about execution and can they get the market fast enough? That like when you when you're looking at a business, how much are you evaluating? Is there truly standalone patentable stuff or whatever the version of IP protection is for that business versus no, I'm looking at every bit like so I'll, I'll open on our side. We we could almost care less about intellectual property at developer town. Like if you have it, great. I mean, it's it check the box. It's awesome. You should go protect it if, if there's something to protect there. But we're almost on the flip side of like that. That means nothing if you actually want to win in the market, right? It's all about execution. Somebody else is going to ignore your IP and compete with you and you have to be willing to sue them. Like, you know, all that stuff weighs in. So I'd be interested in your thought as an angel. 
is it any different? Are you looking for somebody where, okay, maybe even if this isn't successful, I know they'll be able to sell the IP, it, you know, even if the company implodes or whatever the case may be. There's a real asset there. Yeah. I, I would be like-minded around kind of the value of it and just, and I think much of it though is from my experience of it's very seldom that I think there is IP that's defensible. You know, sometimes that's just, you know, nobody's taking the time or effort to see if it's patentable or to go through the process and there's such a delay. In other cases, around, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of cases, you know, around, you know, certain algorithms, you know, that somebody think is unique, it, it, they might differentiate. But once again, it then gets into the execution. And can you really bring that packaged up in something that in the market, even if it's bought by somebody else, it really gives them an, a job? I've seen an exception or two, but they've been rare. And I haven't personally been involved in them. It's been stuff I've been aware of in an industry. Co-founders, does it matter to you if it's a because for some investors, it does. Does it matter for you if it's a single entrepreneur going it alone? Do you prefer co-founders? Do you like two co-founders, but not three co-founders? Do you give this any thought at all? Does it matter to you? I've always, there's something to me about strength in numbers. So two, I, two or more, but I guess I've usually seen two, not three. I think I'm thinking of a case currently that you know I'm talking to three technical and kind of two business people. I think it's moral support. If, if you... Because it can always lead to division and strife and kind of stress in the system. But I think in general, uh, the pros outweigh the cons. And when it doesn't work out between the people, there's usually fundamental problems in the business. You know, it wasn't per se, you know, one of the people being a bad actor or something along those lines. Now, I have seen where uh, two people were very involved in the business. I'd say in parallel, had equal kind of effort in mind sharing the business and something can change in one of those people's personal situation. And in that, you know, personal situation financially, personal situation health wise, et cetera. And that can then add some stress in the business that might not have been there if it was a single person. But I do believe that uh, having a couple people when possible helps the cause. It just helps split the work and make those hours sometimes a little more enjoyable, bearable, whatever the right word is. So, and sometimes you have two spouses then who you can commiserate. Right. NDAs. Do you sign them? How do you think about them? If somebody says, I'd love to sit down and talk to you about my idea, but I need you to sign this first. What are your thoughts? I, you know what? I see people usually super early. And so it's never, almost never an issue. You know, when it's come up, I just said I don't. And, you know, it's it's never been an issue because they weren't getting other people to sign them anyway. So uh, it's not been a big issue for me. I want to get into your, this next one's going to be a little weird. I want to get into your head a little bit or emotions or whatever it is. Do you suffer from fear of missing out? When you're talking to these companies, so at any given point in time, in my mind, I'm imagining you talking with, like actively talking with like four or five companies. Then I, in my mind, I imagine you with like five to 15 companies on the back burner that you're checking in with maybe every couple of months just to see where they're at. Like, so at any point in time, if you're, if you're engaged in or working 20 ish deals and, the, you know, in the theory that you might invest in one of those, right? Like for me, cause I suffer from this, like, I'm always like, but we'll wait, like, but this is the last one I talked to. So that's the best one. That's the one I'm most excited about. Then I'm going to talk to the other one tomorrow. And then, I, then that's going to be the best one. And the one I'm most excited about and a little bit, of that's FOMO, right? Like how do you, I, you must deal with that at some level. Like how do you deal with that? I, I would say it's not a big issue for me for a couple of reasons. One is I've kind of always had a day job and this has been a hobby, right? So it's not, this is not my career day job that I'm a VC or, or that I don't have to work. And therefore, you know, angel investing is my my job as, a, as an individual investor. And because most of the organization I talk to, I have some knowledge. It's either healthcare related, which has been a lot of my background, or I've known the founders or they come highly recommended. And it's, you know, the technology I'm aware of or something along those lines. So I feel I'm talking to people and the discussions and relationships are enjoyable and rewarding on their own. And it, maybe it's just because I'm not looking for them that I'm seeing other people around that I'm like, I wish I had more time or, or this or that. So it hasn't been a big issue. I would say there have been a couple of times I have not gotten involved in a business mostly because I didn't have time or something that have become very successful. So I didn't put any money into it or have any other kind of relationship on a board or anything like that. And they've done very well. And so, you know, there, there have been a couple of those, but, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to wish them the best and it, it, see that excess and exciting. And that's something that, that you was, know, I really missed out on probably. 
that was way too mature of an answer. That is <laughs> no, not uh, what I'm looking yeah, for. Sorry. Yeah. It's, you know, dang it. Yeah. Maybe it's just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess these are two separate questions. How do you find deals and how do deals find you? Great question. That would mean I, I have a, a process where people know of me, you know, or maybe and, you don't, and, and, or maybe you're thinking yeah, about it. The so first, I the would first say most out, people, you know, I'm not known as a, as a, one of the, I'm definitely not known as an angel investor in Indianapolis on any, you know, uh, oh, that you know, was before this yeah. podcast. Well, yeah, I, mean, no, I don't know about that. But, tens uh, of listeners. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's to, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. A dozen, you know. So <laughs> uh, I, I think it's just through relationships, just because I'm an old guy, you know, is probably the best thing. And in some cases, it's a vertical space like healthcare. That somebody has found somebody else in town. Sometimes they are an angel or a fund and said, you know, hey, we don't do health care or talk to Carlson or they somebody else then finds me because it's a certain part of healthcare I know. In other cases, it's just, you know, personal relationships, somebody I've previously worked for. In some cases, I've done some uh, things in Chicago just because that's where I grew up. And in those cases, you know, it's, it's people up there who've been sometimes in other kind of investment, you know, angel investing and kind of non-SAS or non-B2B. And, you know, they've just because I know them and I've worked with them in those other areas, they've, you know, said, hey, I know this guy, Carlson, you know, he knows something about technology and, and those kind of things. So it's mostly my personal network. Sometimes, you know, it's somebody I don't know, but just because it's uh, healthcare, I think is the best example. I would say uh, I have been able to spend some time in other industries of selling technology to traditional markets. Doxley, it was legal. It, uh, another company I'm a big fan of in town called PureView sells to CPA firms. Uh, and so the healthcare, the stuff I've done is to a lot of traditional organizations. So I'd be, I'd say something that probably a lot of smart people kind of steer away from because those people sometimes are in a notorious long and making decisions. They don't buy a lot of uh, new technology. So, uh, but as those markets evolve and mature in their kind of embracing of kind of cloud technologies and new ways of doing workflow and productivity, I, I think those are huge opportunities. I related to that. I think you know this, although we've never really talked about it. I use you a little bit as a filter or sounding board for companies that I may or may not be interested in, right? Like that, that I think Maybe I'm interested, but I want a second opinion, or maybe I'm not interested, but because I do suffer from fear of missing out, unlike <laughs> you, you adult, that I, like I'm, I'm looking for somebody to, to like validate that it's a bad idea. How many people in your network do you play that role for where you're like, you know, you're a little bit of a, a like th they're introducing you to somebody because they want you to come back and be like, to, to, you know, thumbs up, thumb sideways, thumbs down. Like, yeah. So I'd say the Chicago example where I've done on uh, it, and I, I think of kind of it going both ways. So where I've looked at some technology companies, uh, startups that investors up there who are used to, as I mentioned earlier, commercial real estate, hospitality, and those kind of things, have said, you know, hey, this coming high, comes highly recommended, or we know somebody related to the business. Could you take a look at it? So I would do that for them. Likewise, uh, you introduced me to somebody who's got a food business. Uh, that, that uh, you know, we're, which I know nothing yeah, about, right, which we're talking to. Yep. And some of the folks I know up in Chicago are in bringing food products to market. Right. So sometimes it does go both ways. And I do think there is a lot of expertise around B2B SaaS here in towns in, in Indianapolis. And it's, you know, everybody knows it as well or better than me of just all the great things that are going on with many of the organizations, you know, High Elf and Developer Town and, and, and a lot of the recent announcements uh, and, uh, and, you know, Launch Fishers, et cetera. But um, I do uh, feel that in some of these other areas that are a little less, you know, whether it's direct to consumer, yeah. uh, you know, I'm working on a project right now in that space. And, you know, I'm now having to reach out to people I know socially who do a lot of work in consumer, but, you know, I've never really had business relationships with. And for them, it's exciting to kind of interact with a startup. They've been in the same job as a CMO uh, or, you know, kind of in market research, an right. executive for a market research company. So they spend zero time in startups and it's exciting. So it's easy to engage them. But uh, those are folks that I never thought I would engage on startups. So I do like to see that variety just because, you know, it just, it's finding its way to me. But I'm finding I'm having to draw on other, you know, relationships I have in some cases because it is and, you know, pure technology. So there's a classic trap that I put, so I've fallen into this trap. We've seen tons of investors fall into this trap when you're evaluating a deal. It's the, if I were a single mother 
would I use this software, right? Like it's every investor puts themselves in the, in the place of the user and ask themselves, you know, it, you know, would I use this software? And there's this great, I, and I can't place it. And I've been trying to, as we've been talking, there's this great podcast years ago that I listened to where, you know, this, I think it was on how I built this. Uh, so it must not have been years ago. It must've been like a year ago where one of the founders was basically talking about, it might've been Spanx where she was like, every time she would go to an investor to all males, right? Mm-hmm. One, like mm-hmm. a bunch of white males yep. to, to raise money for Spanx. Like every single one of them would be like, well, would I wear these? Like, you know, in their head, right. like, like sure. it's one of the sure. fundamental flaws of investing, right? Where, or in, in that particular case, she would, she would then go to, what, what she found out is like all of them would take the product home, give it to their wife, give it to their daughter, and and then take them as a proxy. And, and I think one of the things she was really articulate at pointing out in that podcast, which really stuck with me, was, you know, e- even your wife is not a good proxy for the market we're going after. You're a venture capitalist. Your wife is not living the life of, sure. you know, sure. our target person right. who's shopping right. at Target, right. literally at Target, right? And this might have been on the pitch. I can't remember, but it was a point, like the point, even though the the founder didn't stick with me, the point really stuck with me. And we've seen that played out again and again and again, where, you know, and ain't like most investors are, are trying to put themselves in the place of the buyer and they may or may not be qualified to do that. One, be interested if you ever feel like you find yourself in that scenario and that, but more importantly, is like, how do you deal with that? How do you get out of it? How do you get out of your own head and to really understand you know, if this is a real market opportunity, regardless maybe of your personal experience. Yeah, I think it's a good filter to have. It shouldn't be the primary filter. Unfortunately, I don't have it. I pr- lean a little bit more on tell me about the interactions you're having with prospects and your you know early customers and really using them as the proxy. Uh, just because after many years of kind of being in sales and sales management in those roles, I'm able to inspect that more effectively. Just like other people can really dive in on a product uh, and a roadmap or somebody else, you know, kind of has different expert, you know, maybe around marketing strategy and tactics and those things. So uh, that that's what I lean on the most. And in some cases then, and I think if you're an institutional investor or you're a mature venture angel investor, you have a very strong network of people who all the time are looking at things. And often when deals come to you, it's from somebody else who's a very seasoned investor or investor group. And so you've got kind of that group think going on. For me, because I'm seeing them earlier, they're not talking to institutional investors often. It's something I've got to kind of, I go and say, hey, let's talk about those relationships you have. And in other cases, I've had situations where and, and this is worked for me without looking for it, where there were two founders, just talking to them individually and seeing not just the chemistry between them, uh, but do they view the business the same way and the opportunity the same way? And so now that is something that it just because it found its way to me is one way to kind of sanity check. Are they looking at the customers the same way? Do they look at the problem the same way? Do they look at, you know, kind of uh, how they're going to go attack the market the same way? And so that's something I've, I've tried to do a little bit when I, you know, meet an organization. Usually if there are a couple of co-founders, you're meeting with both of them. I find it's nice to kind of talk to both of them. And sometimes if they're not on the same page, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means they can communicate a little better, or maybe there's a one plus one equals three that they're just not tapping into just because they're very busy. One person's writing code and the other person's out in the market. It's not necessarily a big red flag, but it is something that I think you can work on. So that's something, that'd be something I have used as opposed to me, you know, do the Spanx fit, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. I want to close on some uplifting, funny stuff. So I'm interested, like, in all the conversations you've had with entrepreneurs, biggest gaffes, like things that they've said that you're like, I can't believe you said that to, to you. Like, you want me to invest in your business and you said that. I would say one was somebody had one of the prettiest PowerPoint presentations I've ever seen, you know, and I'm sure used some expensive template or something. I, I, I don't know. Uh, we were talking about their kind of sales projections and kind of the assumptions, you know, how many, you know, an average ARR, you know, and how many places and everything was off by a factor of 10 as we started digging into it. And uh, they were very confident, you know, in, in these numbers and kind of the, the final numbers. And as I, we just broke it down it, and, they just literally froze, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and people who have a business and some clients. And so that was kind of interesting. And I don't, I wasn't the first person seen it. I'm assuming other people probably just, you know, were too nice to say something about it, but yes, exactly. And, uh, so it was very uncomfortable and, you know, actually, I want want to pick at that. I was, I thought we were done. We're not done because you just brought up an interesting point. We get, I mean, you know, my partner, 
Michael, who I love, you know, and I actually do think this is a gift he gives entrepreneurs all the time. He's pretty direct with mm-hmm. feedback mm-hmm. on the idea. And and I believe this and he believes this, that that like not enough entrepreneurs get direct, honest feedback, right? Whether whether you believe it or not, it's a gift every time it's given to you, right? Sure. Like, so sure. Because if, if one person's thinking it and saying it, there are at least 10 or 20 people who thought it and didn't say it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So even if you disagree with it, yeah. like you need to take that, own it, you know, rock, you know, rock it out and, and solve it or have, have a better way to rebut it or whatever the case may be. I think you're probably somewhere in between is my guess based on some of the interactions I've sat, sat down with you with where you're willing to give feedback. You may not pick at every scab that you see. Like, how do you, what do you think your role is in that kind of feedback? Sure. Both constructive and positive. And how do you try to balance that? I, I think it's a great topic. So I give myself a C, C plus in kind of be, I'm in the middle, you know, and I think the is specific and as unfiltered as possible is probably a good thing, uh, you know, just because people don't have a lot of time. In my case, because I'll usually meet with people multiple times, it's a hobby again, that I kind of leave it for later in the discussions. And I'd say people who I've begun a relationship with, uh, you know, on some ongoing basis, we meet once a month or something, even if I have not put any money into the company or anything like that, uh, or don't have a formal role of any kind. In those cases, I'll get really pretty you know, brutal down the road because now I'm investing time and, you know, and you built some trust. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and that's there and I feel I'm not damaging the relationship, but I probably on the initial meeting or two, I think it's my defense mechanism. Well, maybe I'm would giving them bad advice by pointing that out. Maybe it's a better story or maybe I'm not getting it. So that's, that's, I think the reason I would justify why I get a C grade. <laughs> or the, the, the food guy we met with, you might just be nervous, which I yeah. think in that particular yep. case. Yeah, that's the, a great example. It's the first that's, conversation that's, he probably had. That's, and, that's, yeah. that's a good point. That, that's so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I do think, uh, and, and I would say if you're, pitching someone. It's, it's very early in its idea, or you just have a couple customers or, you know, you just you know, first release of a product. I'd ask them for that because I think many people very seldom do they share everything. And so I think if you give them and, re- you know, say, please, you know, give it to me straight. I'd appreciate your candor. And sometimes you can walk out of a meeting and feel you didn't get it. Never hurts when you're sending your thank you, which I'd always say follow up with a thank you note, even if they were completely uninterested and just say, you know, if there's anything else that you you feel I could have done, I'd appreciate it. And I've had a couple of people do that to me and I've always had another thing or two. Sometimes it was something that hit me, but it was sometimes it was something that came up that I just didn't share. And I use that as an opportunity. You know, they're not in the room and to say, hey, you might look at this or, you know, I, I was unimpressed by this part of it or I think this is a little weaker. So. You know, that might be another way to solicit that. Nice. You, you have nothing to lose. So just keep keeping it rolling. Uh, you just mentioned thank you notes. Other solid, like gold star, this is what the pros do in follow-ups and anything that you're like stands out to you when you meet with somebody and, and they they do something that was unexpected, surprise and delight? Yeah. I Well, uh, if they're a food business, getting free food's always nice. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, but that, that's pretty rare that you're – talking to food businesses. So I would say if you were to follow up a month or two later, so if it went nowhere, and I'm not talking about investor updates or those kind of things, yeah. but just a matter of, you know, hey, I just want to thank you for the feedback or I just give them a status of the business. Don't expect them to reply. But every once in a while, somebody's connected some dot down the road and something that they didn't remember or have time to think about might re-engage them because this is always taking longer than most people think, right? You know, and so I think it's something that, uh, you know, like the old kind of marketing nurturing campaign or drip campaign or whatever it is. Um, you know, I wouldn't say every 30 days, but I'd say, you know, once every, you know, two, three, four months, you know, if there's some development in the business that never hurts because they might know somebody that makes sense for you to talk to or something like that. So I, I think that ongoing follow-up would be one thing. I think the other piece is in, in addition to asking for, some feedback in, in the thank you is I would say uh, I've had even some young people say, you know, if I can ever help you in any way, please let me know. And in one case, it was a uh, couple of Ball State graduates and I had a niece who was going to Ball State and I thought, you know, it was, you know, it connected them to kind of, you know, hear about you know sororities, I think it was at the time. So, you know, that was some little thing. I would never think I was going to talk to them again or anything like that. And uh, they were like, sure, we'd love to help, right? You know, and they were, yeah. So that'd be a 
very simple example, but you know, it never hurts to have that connection and that relationship and just, you know, be appreciative. Nice. All right. We're way over time. I'm going to let yeah, you go. Great. Um, Thank you. I twisted your arm to do this. Seriously, dude, this is fantastic. I'm going to twist your arm to do a part two on enterprise sales at some point. Okay. Uh, not right away. I'll, That'd I'll be give, great. You, give you a breather. I'd enjoy doing it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, hey, if if people want to get a hold of you, sure. is there a way that they can do sure. that? Sure. Absolutely. It's uh, Bob C, Bob C at gmail.com. B-O-B-C, B-O-B-C twice at gmail.com. Right on. I'd love to hear from anybody. Thanks, man. Thank you. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.